Welcome everyone to Dartmouth College virtually um, and the Northeast University Development Consortium Conference. Um, NEUDC is the largest conference in development economics in the world, and this year is going to be our largest NEUDC ever. Um, over the next two days, the Dartmouth community, and I checked this morning, we're now above 900 registered attendees, will have the opportunity to engage with the frontier of research and development economics. 234 original research papers presented from every continent but that ever elusive Antarctica. Um, links to listen to all 60 conference parallel sessions are on the conference website. All you'll have to do is just click on a session title and that will take you into the Zoom webinar for the session. Um, so that's on the schedule page of the website. Uh, and as uh, registered attendees know, we've also got a parallel space running throughout the conference where participants will have the opportunity to um, engage and discuss uh, informally in greater depth um, in an in a 8-bit world um, that we've developed for the conference. Um, I'm Eric Edmonds. I'm a professor in economics here at Dartmouth. Uh, Paul Novosad, who's also um, in the economics department, and I are extremely grateful to have um, uh, all the people that have helped us put together this meeting. Um, there's been more than 40 faculty from any UDC member institutions, um, including many here at Dartmouth, who helped select papers from the more than 600 submissions we received. Thank you so much. Uh, 60 faculty have volunteered their time to chair the 60 parallel sessions that are running over the next two days. Thank you. Um, Putting together a conference of this size is an enormous undertaking and the staff of the John Sloan Dickey Center for International Understanding at Dartmouth College have done everything to make this happen. We are really grateful for both the financial support from the Dickey Center and the time and attention of its staff, especially uh, Tom Kandon, um, Sharon Chabot St. Martin and Judith um, Von Rien and Jackson. Thank you so much. Um, the challenges and opportunities of globalization Dartmouth cluster initiative is making today's kickoff keynote possible. So we really appreciate that and their support. Um, and we really appreciate the opportunity to begin this conference with the discussion of development in the time of COVID um, with Penny Goldberg from Yale University. And to introduce Penny Goldberg, um, it's my privilege to introduce you to um, certainly my favorite of, of her former students, um, which is uh, Professor Nina Pouchnik, who is the uh, Niehaus Family Professor in International Studies um, and the Chair of the Department of Economics at uh, Dartmouth College. Nina? Yeah. Thank you, Eric, and welcome to everyone. It's amazing to see that we have uh, 200 participants uh, joining us from all over the world. Uh, it is my honor to introduce Professor Penny Goldberg. Uh, she is currently the Elihu Professor of Economics at Yale University. Uh, Goldberg has had a distinguished career as a researcher. She's drawn to tackling policy relevant questions in international economics and development. Her research has earned her many academic honors. She's a member of National Academy of Sciences, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. She's a recipient of Sloan Foundation Fellowship, the Guggenheim Fellowship and the Bodosaki Prize in Social Sciences. But what's the most impressive um, virtue of uh, Goldberg is that she's an amazing role model for young economists. In 2000, just 20 years ago, she was the first woman to receive tenure at the Department of Economics at Yale. From 2007 to 2011, she served as the first female editor-in-chief of the American Economic Review, one of the most prestigious and influential journals in economics. She is currently president-elect of the Econometric Society, and has previously served as vice president of the American Economic Association. In all these roles, Goldberg is known for her open-mindedness about using a variety of methodological approaches to find answers to important questions. She builds bridges and makes connections across fields of economics, and this approach that le leads to rich, nuanced, policy-relevant discoveries. Throughout her career, Goldberg has also been a role model for how to bring academic rigor to policymaking. Uh, throughout her studies, she has examined some of the most complex issues that affect developing countries, including the determinants and effects of trade policy, the relationship between international trade and inequality and poverty, and issues related to intellectual property rights protection in developing countries. Most recently, uh, she has examined the resurgence of protectionism in the United States and its consequences, not just for the United States, but globally. From 
2018 to March 2020, Goldberg served as the chief economist of the World Bank Group. There, she supervised the World Development Report, which studied the relationship between economic development and global production networks. She was also involved in the bank's efforts to improve the measurement of human capital in developing countries, as well as the measurement of legal discrimination against women. For all these reasons, Goldberg is a perfect speaker for the inaugural Distinguished Lecture on Globalization and the 2020 NEUDC Welcome Keynote. Before I hand the floor to Professor Goldberg, I would like to um, encourage you to pose questions for her in Q&A. I will use these questions in a discussion that will follow her talk. Welcome, uh, Penny, and so the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, Nina, for this very kind and very generous introduction. I, I'm truly honored to be giving a keynote in this important conference. Uh, so thank you very much for inviting me, and perhaps more importantly, thank you for organizing the conference. Uh, I have to say, among my, I don't know what my most important accomplishment is, but what I can say with certainty is that for me, the most enjoyment, the, the most enjoyable, the most important part of my work has always been interacting with students, interacting with graduate students and having students like Nina and the many others I have advised is what I consider to be perhaps our most important mission. Uh, it, it's also something that keeps us going when times are tough, like, uh, like in the past year. So uh, I'm particularly happy to be giving this keynote and I'm particularly happy to be giving it, uh, having been invited by uh, one of my best former students. Um, so uh, this is uh, a keynote organized by the Center of Globalization. And uh, when I thought about what topic to talk about, initially my inclination was to choose something other than the coronavirus pandemic, because I'm sure that by now there is fatigue and most of us are a bit tired hearing about it. Uh, however, it's, I find it impossible to think about development going forward uh, or globalization without taking the current crisis, the, the pandemic, into account. So with that in mind, I decided to talk about how I see development going forward, um, uh, given the pandemic we experienced in the past year and we probably experience in the coming year at least. COVID-19 is, in my view, the, the most severe global shock that we have experienced since World War II. It has certainly changed the way we do business, the way we interact with each other, and I'm, I'm sure it will change uh, these things also going forward. As I already said, there is still a lot we don't know. There is a lot we learned in the past year, but there are still many questions that um, we don't uh, have the answers uh, for. So uh, in the following, I, I decided to use this talk to organize my thoughts, to structure a little bit my thoughts um, around COVID-19 and, and list in the process some of the questions I would like to have, to have the answers to. Some of these questions are going to be uh, specific to COVID-19, but I think many of these questions are more general and, and might become more important going forward if epidemics or pandemics become more frequent as uh, some epidemiologists have predicted. So uh, let, let me start by giving some overview, a brief overview of uh, COVID-19 as it has affected developing countries. And here I have to always start with the important disclaimer, the important caveat that when we talk about developing economies, these economies consist of an incredibly heterogeneous set of countries. They include countries like Peru that has been devastated uh, by the pandemic and countries like Vietnam where uh, that was hardly touched uh, by, by coronavirus. They include countries like China and countries like uh, Somalia. So, so the range of countries is vast. So the usual disclaimer applies. I will use the term to, to simply refer to countries that have fewer resources than advanced economies. So when we think about the COVID-19 in the context of developing economies, I think there are two taxonomies that may be helpful. Um, one is in terms of the nature of the shock. And there we can think of COVID-19 as representing a health shock. That was the primary shock. But we can also think of it as being an economic shock. And the economic shock in turn has many different components. The first one 
is that it was a simultaneous supply and demand shock. Um, second, it was a financial shock. It affected markets all over the world. Um, and third, it was a commodity price shock. It certainly affected the price of oil, but it also affected the prices of many other commodities. And as you can see in the slides, I put the financial shock and commodity price shock in red. And this is because I think even though these components are present in all countries, I think the last two could potentially have very severe consequences for developing countries for reasons that will become clear in a moment. Um, a different taxonomy will distinguish between direct and indirect effects. And in terms of direct effects, I think primarily of the direct effects, the health effects of COVID-19. By indirect effects, I mean the effects that arise from the fact that for, in order for countries to uh, contain the spread of the virus, they imposed restrictions that affected the economy. Um, and there is then, then a third type of effect that arises from international spillovers. So even if you consider a country that uh, was not affected directly by COVID-19, that did not have to implement any drastic policies to contain the virus, still this country is going to be affected by what is going on in the rest of the world. And again, I, I uh, uh, put this in red because I think this component is particularly uh, uh, important uh, for developing countries and especially small developing countries. So with that in mind, let me briefly talk about what has been done so far in the economics research community. Uh, one thing that has been striking about the current crisis is that the research, the economics research community was immediately mobilized. And um, I think it's Jim Stock who said this, this contrasts with the experience in the past. Usually economists wait until we have enough data um, to, 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 um, to do our analysis. And this is because we place great value on robust analysis and robust predictions. And, and sometimes by the time we are comfortable uh, making any statements, the crisis is over. This has not happened this time. So economists jumped right in. And I think this is this is justified because there has never been a shock as big as uh, the COVID-19 uh, crisis. And it was hard for all of us to think about anything else, ignoring the pandemic. So uh, th there have been so far two types of research, um, broadly speaking. One is the research that has been conducted, conducted by modelers. Uh, and uh, these modelers within economics focused mostly on epidemiological models, pointing out that many of these models have in some sense, the same structure as quantitative macro models. Um, they pointed out that the very simple SIR model that epidemiologists used at the very beginning of the pandemic boils down to just one parameter, the famous R0. Um, the, the very simple, the very naive version of this model supplied a single R0 for the entire, for the global population. And one of the many insights of economies was that uh, first of all, the R0 is heterogeneous. It's heterogeneous within populations, you know, depending on many factors, depending on age, depending on uh, demographics. Uh, as I will show you in a moment, I would argue that there is also enormous heterogeneity across countries globally. Um, and second, very importantly, the R0 is endogenous. So it depends on economic and social behavior, which is affected by uh, by our strategies to contain the virus. Um, on the empirical side, um, uh, again, it's very hard to, to do research when we don't have data. But what many economists did is con they conducted real-time surveys based on uh, using phones, using whatever technology was available to assess the effects of COVID-19 and also the effects of uh, many policy responses, for example, cash transfers, in order to aid uh, those affected. And uh, I won't even attempt to cite the many people and the many institutions that conducted real-time surveys. They range from the World Bank to, to many think tanks and many individual researchers across universities all over the world. This, this research, these real-time surveys collectively document enormous pain, real pain in low-income countries. But still going forward, I think the question for many of us is going to be how persistent are these effects? Perhaps it's not surprising that, that many countries, many communities experience significant pain. 
but how persistent are they and what are, what are the aggregate implications going forward? So uh, very generally speaking, there is a lot of research that uh, going forward could provide a more complete, more accurate picture of what has happened and what the long-term effects are going to be. And in the process, we can perhaps also inform model parameters that can one day lead to better modeling uh, and, and better recommendations in the future. I think it's fair to say that everyone was unprepared for what happened. The last pandemic was more than 100 years ago, but many predict that pandemics are going to, to become more frequent. And if that's the case, it might be important to understand what the process um, of infection, what the process of diffusion uh, of, of, of a virus is. So let me give you a brief roadmap for the, for the remaining uh, talk. Uh, I will start by talking a little bit about what, ha what has happened in developing countries so far, focusing first on the public health effects. Um, and, and there I'm going to, to draw heavily on a paper I, I prepared for the Brookings Papers on Economic Activity. This is joint work with Tristan Reid of the World Bank. Um, uh, I'll talk then a little bit about the policy response, um, financial markets, how they were affected in developing countries, and then I will uh, focus on the long run effects and questions, uh, touching on issues such as human capital, poverty and inequality, global supply chains, technology adoption, climate change and institutions. So let me start with the public health effects first, uh, the first other effects that we're concerned about. So in general, the expectation in the, in the early months of 2020 was that developing countries would be hit much harder than advanced economies. And uh, if you ask me whether this prediction, I was part of, of, uh, of those who said that things seemed utterly uh, hopeless for developing countries. Uh, if you ask me what, uh, where we stand right now, I would say that this expectation turned out to be correct in Latin America, but not in Asia or Africa. So in fact, I would go as far as saying that on average, and the word average here is important, low income countries fared better than higher income countries. And the question is why? So let me um, you know, set the stage by, um, by laying out some of the arguments that uh, people used in the early months to justify uh, optimism or pessimism regarding the fate of developing countries. Reasons for optimism include the age distribution in developing countries. So in many low income countries, uh, people are much younger. One example I often mention is the example of Niger, where the median age is 15 years, one five. So in, in such a country, you may be less concerned about a, 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 an epidemic that affects primarily, not exclusively, but primarily uh, older people. Obesity, uh, obesity has also been identified as an important risk factor. And while in within advanced countries, the, the lower income people, uh, this, the, those who are socioeconomically disadvantaged tend to be obese. Uh, in across the world, the opposite is true. So we see less obesity in the very poor countries. Uh, people hypothesize that weather could be a factor, uh, that warm and humid climates would uh, contribute to a slower spread of the virus. And finally, and importantly, low connectivity. Low connectivity has always been a main, a, a, a severe challenge for developing countries, especially in Africa. But in this particular case, it seemed a blessing because at the minimum, it implied that they had more time before the virus arrived, and perhaps they could use this time not to get ready in the sense of getting ventilators, that was not an option, but perhaps um, taking measures that would contain the spread of the virus. On the other hand, you had important reasons for pessimism. Uh, first and foremost, the low capacity of healthcare systems. Uh, there is a reason developing countries are called developing countries, they have fewer resources. And on top of that, uh, the many developing countries, especially the cities in developing countries, are characterized by conditions that would, uh, would suggest higher spread and higher mortality, overcrowding, urban poverty, multi-generational households, which meant that it might be very hard to separate the elderly from the young, that all together implies that lockdowns 
would be less effective. So uh, on balance, it was not clear which way it would go. So, so what happened? Um, so so th this graph, by the way, shows you what, what the different risk factors look like. So it, is, it, it, it puts um, uh, numbers and, bar and bars on what I just said. Uh, for how income countries, for example, you can see the, the, the percentage of population over 70 is on average 10.6%. In low income countries, uh, this number is 1.8%. Okay, so there's a very big difference. With obesity, let me just point out that there is a very small difference. There's very little difference between upper middle income countries and high income countries, but they, you can contrast those with low income countries. So these are all the reasons that led to optimism. If you, uh, I'm sorry, to, to optimism, right? Uh, if you look at the public health response, okay, there, th this is something that I haven't mentioned, but, but, uh, uh, I'm planning to, to cover it more extensively when I talk about the policy response. Uh, in many developing countries, policymakers, countries uh, reacted very fast. Uh, so if you compute how many days did it take before the country took some action to contain the virus, and this action could be something as simple as taking people's temperature at the airport when they enter the country. In low-income countries, they took action approximately two months before the virus, before the first death the country. In high income countries, um, the, the, the time interval was much shorter. And finally, if you look at the positive test ratio and the positive test ratio, so is the ratio how many positive cases uh, do you have relative to the total cases in the country. So this is often used as a form, as, as a measure of testing capacity. So in, in many low income countries, this ratio is very low. And, and I'm not going to interpret that uh, in a causal way, right? Obviously, if you have very few, very few COVID cases, this test ratio is going to be small. But what this suggests is that whatever tests they have, they are sufficient to capture the, the cases that they may have. In upper middle income countries, uh, this is where this ratio is highest. So think here of cases like Peru, where the testing is clearly not sufficient. And then in high income countries, again, it's higher. So what happened? Let me come back to this question. So this graph is a graph that we created with Tristan uh, starting in May. And uh, let, let me tell you what it, it uh, shows. On the horizontal axis, you have the dates, you know, from February 1st, when the virus uh, started spreading outside China. And then on the vertical axis, you have the total deaths attributed to COVID-19 per million people. So it's uh, it's, it's all adjusted for population. And the, the, the lines, the curves, show the deaths per million by income group um, as per the World Bank classification. So the red line, the one on top, shows the high income countries. The next line, the brown one, shows the high income, I'm sorry, the upper middle income countries. So this graph excludes China. With China, it would be much lower. China is the yellow line at the bottom. As you can see, it's very close to zero. Deaths per million in China are three. Uh, the purple line shows the lower middle income countries. So countries like India go here. And then um, the blue line at the very bottom shows the low income countries. Right. So what is uh, striking in this graph is that the high income countries followed by the upper middle income countries fared much worse in terms of deaths. Um, with Pritham, we started producing this graph end of May. So back then we were here. And many, when, many people, when they first saw this graph, they said it was just a matter of time. Um, so we've been updating this graph month after month. And as you can see, the, some of the patterns remain. The difference between high income countries and upper middle income countries is closing, and that reflects the experience in Latin America. So Latin America is here, including Peru, including Brazil, uh, including Mexico. So this difference is narrowing, but nevertheless, it remains. And now we have a second wave in Europe. So the cases here are rising again. In low income countries, the pattern has not changed. So deaths per million are very low. Um, India, as I'm sure you all know, has experienced a major uh, uh, surge in cases and deaths, but still on a per capita base, 
uh, basis, it's doing much better than countries in Europe or countries in America. Okay, so uh, what is striking, I think, about these patterns is both that the levels are different, but perhaps more importantly, that, that the shape of the curve is very different across different parts of the income distribution. Now, this is a very coarse classification, as we all know. You, even though we distinguish between countries at different uh, uh, per capita income level, there are still big differences within each group. Another way to show this relationship is to show the relationship between GDP per capita and COVID deaths per million. Okay. So uh, the US is normalized to be one. And, and what you see here is two things. First, there is undeniably, there is a positive relationship between uh, GDP per capita and deaths. So the richer you are as a country, the more deaths you experience. That said, for any income level, pick any income level you want, there is enormous variation. There is enormous variance uh, uh, around this number. And of course, this speaks to the fact that it's still so much we don't understand about how why different countries have experienced this virus so differently. If you think about high income countries, you have Germany right next to Belgium. In Germany, the deaths per capita are around 120. In Belgium, it's like Peru, it's over 1000 at this point. Um, in uh, it, It's very hard to understand what drives these differences. Um, so, uh, before I go on, let me give you some concrete numbers so that you know uh, what, what, what the magnitudes are approximately. Again, these are numbers that change daily. The numbers you see today are taken from no November 5th. So these are the numbers as of yesterday. And, and this is just to give you a sense of how big the differences are across different countries. So if you focus on Europe, so deaths per million in, in the UK are 708, in Spain, 823. As I mentioned in Belgium, that this number is above 1,000 now. Germany is doing very, is, is overperforming. Uh, it's one of the countries that uh, had the, the best experience so far. They, they have managed to contain this number to 133. Coming to let, let me jump to America, to the Americas. The USA is at 726 right now. Um, Mexico, Brazil, Peru has one of the highest numbers in the world. Uh, the, the, most countries here are above 700. Now, this is to be contrasted with what happened in Asia, where these numbers are much smaller. Uh, in Vietnam, it's 0.4. But even, even in India, that experienced this surge, uh, this number is 90. Um, in Turkey, it's 126. And then finally, if you come to Africa, so South Africa is the country with by far with the highest deaths per capita, 330. The next one that I didn't show here is Libya with, with 130. And then countries, populous countries like Nigeria or Angola have essentially have had no COVID. Um, this is not to minimize uh, the, the, the importance of the disease, but I think it's fair to say that if you compare Nigeria and Angola to the US, we are talking about big differences, orders of magnitude, that that uh, that are really um, puzzling. So, what explains these differences? Um, so, so, let me let me suggest some explanations that I think this is where future research uh, may be very productive. So, the first thing that comes to mind is mismeasurement, right? So. Uh, uh, mismeasurement could arise either because countries, low-income countries, don't have the statistical capacity to capture debts, or as some people have postulated, uh, from from manipulation of data. There is no question that there is mismeasurement, and we know that for sure because periodically countries adjust their statistics. They report, they find debts that they have not reported before, and then you see these spikes in the data. So, so we know for sure from revisions of current numbers that there is mismeasurement. But it's very hard to explain these big differences, not only in the levels, but also in the slopes of the curves uh, on uh, based on mismeasurement alone. Um, I, I would also argue that death statistics, statistics are pretty reliable, that, that it's very hard to hide death, especially in this age of social media, in, in this age where many nonprofits are present in developing countries. Uh, we, we saw in many developing countries no deaths reported until 
they became really a problem. If you think about Peru, for a while there were no deaths. Uh, then when uh, COVID hit the, the country hard, we saw the deaths uh, being reported the same the same thing in India. So while I, there is no question that there is some mismeasurement, it's very hard to explain this magnitudes, this difference in magnitudes and slopes based on measurement alone. That said, to the extent that we really want to understand what drives differences across countries, I think it, it would be important going forward to have an accurate measurement of what happened. And one way to do that is by using excess deaths. Now, this is not without problems. So as many of you probably know, the New York Times or the Economist have been reporting such excess deaths for particular countries or for particular cities, but it's much harder to compute them for the, for the global economy, for, for all countries. And uh, they're not without problems, you know, partly because uh, the data is very uh, scarce, and also because it's hard to attribute excess deaths to COVID-19 alone. So just to mention an interesting fact from my work with Tristan, when we were doing this work back in, in May or June, the excess deaths in South Africa were negative, actually. So these are the excess deaths relative to last year. And this was at the period where they were, we knew that there were already positive COVID-19 deaths. So they were in the official statistics, there were COVID-19 deaths, yet if you reported the access de the excess deaths, you would find that there were fewer deaths this year compared to last year. And people hypothesized that part of the reason for this was that as a result of the lockdown measures, people stayed home, there was less drinking and that saved lives. So on net, you had fewer deaths than before. Um, so you can see that this calculation is tricky but nevertheless, I think going forward, if we had more reliable measures of the excess deaths in the months where the, the cases peaked, then we would have some estimate of how many deaths we can attribute to COVID-19. And then perhaps uh, more interestingly, we, we could also uh, conduct these calculations for many months going forward or even year and see what the long run effects is. And that would allow us to capture some of the indirect effects that people hypothesized are very important, especially in developing countries. So while everyone is focused on COVID-19 and, and, and lockdowns, perhaps there are other health conditions that, that are being neglected and maybe these also lead to death, uh, we would be able to capture such effects in the long run by looking at excess death rates. So I think this is this is something that can be done uh, uh, in the future. It, it, the, this kind of research is already going on in the United States based on county level data, but I think it would be much more interesting to do it in developing countries where the data challenges are more severe. Uh, that still leaves us with a question, what drives these big cross-country differences? I, this is, uh, those of you who know my research, you probably know I'm not a cross-country person. I haven't focused my research on cross-country comparisons, but in this particular case, it, it's, it's very hard to um, evade the question of why have, why have countries have had such a, a difference in the experience, in their experience with COVID-19. So again, with the work with, the work, um, with Tristan uh, for, for the Brookings Papers of Economic Activity, we, we identify some factors that uh, are important in explaining the cross-country differences, among of them age, obesity, and population density. And uh, I should mention that these factors have been robust uh, across all specifications we have considered uh, and across time. And no matter what you do, they're already there. So these um, this, uh, uh, health covariates by themselves so age and obesity actually can explain to a certain extent why low income countries have done better. Population density is quite interesting. So we, we have looked at the population density in major urban centers, and it has enormous explanatory power as you would expect, but it doesn't explain why developing countries have done better. By developing countries, I always mean here in this context, the low income countries in Africa and Asia. So I don't mean Latin America, but in, in, in many parts of, of the world, you have mega cities. So you have uh, cities like Lagos or, um, or uh, Jakarta, uh, where the population density is very high. And so in principle, this should make developing countries worse off. And yet, despite the importance, the explanatory power that population density has, uh, we still find that developing countries did better. 
so so uh, in short what what have found in our work is that these health covariates have very high explanatory power but they cannot be the full story so they cannot fully explain why we see these huge differences across countries what's the role of policy um we've, we've investigated in our work i won't show you regressions here because we don't have the time for it, but we, ex we, we, we investigated the effect of many policies, including drastic lockdowns. The, the time that it took for policymakers to implement these policies, compliance as me measured by Google mobility reports. Uh, needless to say that every time you, you use these measures, you lose many countries because for many countries, these reports are not available. <clears throat> but for the countries for which these measures were available, we found the results not to be robust. So early on, we found when we were conducting this work in June, we were finding very strong evidence that policies matter. Then in July, the effect of policies had disappeared. Now we again, when we run this yesterday, we found that again, policy may explain cross-country differences. So those countries that acted fast did better. I think the issue with this type of work um, is that the policy measures we use are just to aggregate and they don't capture the relevant implementation details. And here in this context, implementation was everything. So Germany eventually had a lockdown and the UK had a lockdown, but the way these lockdowns were implemented, or the US had a lockdown, but the way these lockdowns were was implemented was very different. And you know, if there was one, me one message, one very important message from last year's Nobel Prize, which was in development. So uh, the, the Banerjee, Duflo, Kramer, Nobel Prize was that implementation matters. It matters when we, we uh, disperse aid in developing countries, but it also matters when we try to, to contain the spread of the virus in COVID-19. So again, I think there is room for much more detailed work based on micro data, based on um, data that focus on particular countries and particular communities that tries to shed light the question of why did some policies work and others did not. And finally, the other explanation that, that I think is key here and may lead to very interesting research agendas is that we have heterogeneous r nots that could explain the different curves across developing countries. So what I mean by that is, um, if you remember the graph, it's not just that low income countries had lower debts than high income countries, it's just that the pattern of spread, the pattern of diffusion was very different. And that raises the question, is the way that people in developing countries interact with each other different? What is, dif what, what is different between a low income in terms of interaction? What is the difference, the kind of difference that could give rise to this type of curves? Uh, what is the role of family and social networks? So the, the field of network economics has exploded in development economics. Uh, in the last few years, there is a lot of work on networks. Most of the work on networks to date has focused on diffusion of knowledge. So if we have a new technology, how do we make sure that people in a village, in a, in a community in developing country learn about it? Here, what I'm suggesting is a different type of question. We have a virus. How does the virus spread across a network? And conversely, what can we do to contain the spread of the virus. So how can we avoid contagion? This is a question that has been to a certain extent, extent posed in finance, but not in this context to, to my knowledge. So to summarize, I think there are many research questions here. The, the general question is to understand the spatial uh, patterns, the differences in the pandemic's effects. This, this question is interesting also for advanced countries, but I think it's particularly interesting for developing countries and very specific questions improve on measurement, explore the effects of health covariates and policies, but at a very micro level, at the level of states or counties or cities or zip codes, and then model the, the role of social interactions and developments and try to, to um, give an answer to the question of what kind, kind of interactions could generate the curves that we just showed you and why are these curves so different across countries. And eventually I think what this work would do is it would lead to better perhaps developing country specific estimates of r nots that could potentially also inform better policy responses. Uh, I can only hope that the COVID pandemic is, is going to come to an end next year. But again, if pandemics become more frequent going forward, it would be important to understand
how the, the, the patterns may be different uh, in different countries. Now, let me come to the policy uh, response. I think there are many interesting questions here. So, so before, in the previous slide, I focused on the effects of very specific policies, and I suggested investigations at the micro level of how these policies have played out, taking also compliance into account. Um, there is another question which regards the, the origins of these policies, the political economy of policy responses. So why was the, the policy response across different countries, even within countries across states or municipalities, why was it so different? Uh, there's already some work um, in this area. Um, again, I, I won't even attempt to cite it because there are many people uh, working, uh, working on these issues. Um, but I think it's really a first order, order question and, uh, and, and also very interesting intellectually, a very interesting question. Um, I, I think it also raises a more uh, general and I would say almost philosophical questions that might be worth to consider. Um, the general question in my mind is what explains this worldwide, this drastic worldwide response that we've seen? Uh, the response was truly unprecedented. Um, uh, what makes it unprecedented is that for the very first time, countries with very few exceptions agreed to shut down their economies to protect lives. Uh, it, 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 the, the coronavirus pandemic was not the first epidemic. It's, it's not even the first pandemic. But to my knowledge, it's the very first time in history that the whole world uh, Fortunately, not in a synchronized fashion, but uh, with, with a delay of a few months, decided to shut down to protect lives. So, so what explains this enormously uh, big response? So, so I think there are many explanations, and, and some of them are more cynical than others. So, so let me start with a more cynical, if you want. One is that there was high uncertainty, at least in the in the first months, everyone felt at risk, um, and, and therefore um, uh, uh, we decided to go for a very drastic response to feel safe. That explains perhaps what happened in March or April. It's harder to justify what's happening in Europe right now, where again, many countries are shutting down. Uh, there are questions about intergenerational inequality. So we talk a lot about inequality these days, but we never really talk about intergenerational inequality. And this is a component of inequality, a form of inequality that may become relevant because of the pandemic. Uh, we all know that, that no one is completely safe from the virus, but probabilistically speaking, the chance that you are severely affected goes up with age. And so one possibility is that the decision makers tend to be older and they did not fully take the welfare of younger generations into account. Uh, a third possibility is risk aversion by policymakers, especially in settings with high accountability. So uh, if you are up for, for, for election or if you have uh, if you are a constituency that is going to hold you accountable for the deaths in the country, you may play it safe. The fourth possibility that again has been suggested in the literature is there was a lead capture. Uh, even though COVID-19 had devastating effects, as always, the effects were unequal. There, there were also parts of the economy that benefited. So in the US, the big tech was the big winner. And, and uh, apart from the big tech for all of us, those of us who can work remotely, uh, those of us who have PhDs, uh, those of us who have computers, we, we, could, we could maintain our productivity. Those who did not have this option uh, were devastated. So there, there could be some form of some component, some degree of elite capture by those who ended up gaining a lot. And let me also suggest the final explanation, which I think, if it's not the explanation, I think it, 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 it has some merit, uh, is that as per capita incomes have increased uh, worldwide, we place much higher value on life and health than economic prosperity. So in other words, countries today, even as, as um, our behavior has revealed, even the low income country plays high value on objectives other than growth and other than economic prosperities. And again, what has been puzzling about that is that this seems to also be the case in countries with very low incomes. 
Um, again, the reason I, I, I think this deserves some serious consideration is if you think about the last time we had a pandemic, this was more than 100 years ago, that was the, the Spanish flu. Uh, the reason it was called the Spanish flu, it's not because it was more severe in Spain, it's because Spain was not participating in World War I. So therefore, people there noticed the deaths due to the flu. The rest of the world, uh, the world that was affected by the, by the flu at the time was devastated by World War I. So the, the deaths due to the war were so uh, severe and, and, and so numerous that the flu was perhaps not the, the most important priority at the time, and they didn't even notice it. We're in a very different place these days, and this is perhaps a, a, you know, the, always, the, the only silver lining when we consider the current situation, that, that we are rich enough that we can actually uh, that, that we can actually consider what what the, the value of human life is, and uh, in my view, to the extent that we we, we uh, go with this view that uh, that policies reflect not just the objectives of particular parts of uh, the the economy, but actually the general preferences of the constituencies. Uh, there is a lot of information that we can use, uh, we can apply to many other questions. So there's information about what our preferences are. There's, there is information about the value we place on human life. There is information about how we trade off growth against other objectives, including life, including the life of others. So how we value the life of, of the elderly or um, those who are more vulnerable as opposed to just our own lives. And finally, there is also information about how we are expected to manage tail risks in the future. And, you know, one can, can uh, sit on panels and make these points, but I think it would be very useful, uh, and that's where economists have an advantage, to, be, to, to try to address these questions within a structured framework. Um, and, and also ask in the process the question, how, can, how do the, these answers vary by stage of development? Uh, do, do all countries give the same answers uh, to, to, to these questions? I think, and I'll come to that a little bit later, if I have time, is that, that apart from the fact that these questions are interesting from intellectual point of view, they also have important implications for things like climate change. When we think about our response to climate change, and one of the big questions there has been, should we be treating developing countries different, differently from advanced countries? Um, these kind of questions um, um, bear a lot of weight. Now, let me uh, switch gears and talk about something uh, very different, um, and namely what the effects of the pandemic have been in financial markets. And here I will focus on, on developing countries. So I, I, if you remember, I put this in red initially. And the reason is that many feared that, um, that uh, uh, the effects on financial markets would be devastating for developing countries. So let me um, tell you, uh, let me show you in pictures what happened. Uh, and again, I assume many of you know that. This is a well-known graph that shows what happened to capital flows out of developing countries in March. So in March, there was a massive outflow. These are non-resident uh, purchases of EM stocks and bonds. There was a massive, massive outflow uh, out of developing countries, out of emerging markets. And um, uh, this was truly unprecedented. So uh, on the horizontal axis, you can see what these flows have looked, uh, have looked like since 2010. Nothing compares to what happened in March uh, 2020. At, at that point, uh, there was panic in the markets because many of developing countries uh, uh, were predicted to face serious solvency problems. It turned out, and that, that's where I'm, uh, I think Tristan and I are more optimistic than, or, or were more optimistic at the time than many others. Uh, we pointed out that uh, if you actually took a more broad view of capital flows, if you included uh, net capital flows to major emerging markets, uh, then the picture looked bleak. There's no question about that, but not as bleak as uh, thought. Uh, it was certainly not unprecedented. So this is what happened in March. This is what happened during the big commodity price shock in 2015. And moreover, we pointed out that all these traced very closely uh, what was happening to the price of oil. Uh, relatedly, if you actually look at the accumulated net flows 
out of developing countries, uh, this black line you see here uh, is Saudi Arabia. So Saudi Arabia is one of the countries that experienced one of the largest capital outflows. Well, this is highly correlated with uh, oil, pro oil production. For many other countries, actually, the net flow, the net flow change was not that big. And in fact, for many countries, uh, uh, the trends were not reversed. So for Vietnam or Indonesia, the trends were not reversed. So, so the, the picture was bleak, but not as bleak as one predicted. There was general concern that the borrowing costs uh, would go up for developing countries. Uh, and again, they did go up. So that's again what happened in March, okay, where they spiked. Uh, these are the sovereign spreads. Then um, the, the, the IMF and the World Bank and the G20 announced debt, debt forbearance. So that's the DSSI initiative that uh, suspends service, uh, debt service payments uh, for uh, for a while for the low for low for low income countries or gives countries the option to apply for suspension. So once they so 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 uh, once the, the these institutions announce this initiative, what's interesting is that the spreads went up again, and this is partly because many thought that there would be a moral hazard problem, and uh, private investors would, would consider this to be uh, to be a sign that they were more likely to be repaid, that the credit risk was going up. But after this initial spike, uh, spread started going down again. And uh, it, certainly they have not returned to pre-COVID levels by now. There's still very high borrowing costs for developing countries are still high, very high, but they're not as high as in March. So things again look a little a little better than initially um, initially expected. Uh, what about commodity prices? That's the other, you know, if you remember, that's the other uh, economic effect that was expected to be truly devastating for developing countries. Uh, we saw a huge decline in oil prices in March. Uh, that was partly because of COVID, but to remind you, this was also partly because of the breakdown in collusion between Russia and Saudi Arabia. So, and again, this breakdown of collusion could, could have been triggered by the pandemic, but I would consider it also a distinct shock. So this is the big collapse of oil prices. And this, of course, affected oil exporting developing countries. Uh, and many other commodity prices were going down at the same time. Oil prices have not recovered. Oil prices are still down as we would expect, because worldwide demand is down. Uh, but still, they're not as low as they used to be. Regarding other commodity prices, many of them have recovered, including copper, including sugar. Um, so again, the picture is not great, but it's not as bleak as one expected. So a preliminary conclusion, again, is that at the beginning, uh, the, the picture in the financial markets was truly scary for developing countries. and. Uh, uh, everyone was expecting a major debt crisis in this in this in this uh, in these economies. This did not happen. As with the health effects, the financial on the financial side, the, the the effects ended up being less severe than expected. And the question is again, why? Um, there again, there I think there are many interesting research questions here. And uh, to the extent that that something good happened in this case, so the health effects ended up less severe than we thought. And also the financial effects ended up less severe than we thought. It, it's, it's, a, it's a very interesting question to ask. So what did we do right here? And so many would credit the monetary policy in the US and Europe, the very aggressive policy with, um, with reversing the trend, with reversing the capital flows out of developing countries. And I think this, this has certainly been important in stabilizing markets. But I think there are also other factors in play here. And the first one is that the commodity price shocks the commodity price shocks have been partially reversed, not completely, but the picture is not as bleak as originally thought. And also that the expectations of the health devastation in developing countries did not materialize. So the fact that many developing countries managed to, 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 to keep the, the, the uh, COVID spread and deaths under control um, has also benefited them on the financial side. Again, there's enormous heterogeneity within this group. Not all countries are out of the, of the woods, but, but many are doing better than expected. That said, there are still many countries that are in debt distress or at risk of debt distress. Again, with the work with Tristan, we point out that the majority of these countries, almost all of these countries, 
were in that distress even before the COVID crisis. So it's a very serious situation, but, but it cannot be attributed to COVID-19 alone. The more general question, again, uh, in this context, I think, is what explains capital flows? And uh, uh, there is a lot of research on this area, naturally, already. Uh, but this particular shock, the COVID-19 shock and the policy response, gives us additional data points to, to, to try to uh, investigate this question. The question is, what is the role of interest rates? What's the role of yields? What's the role of macro expectations or the role of commodity prices? And uh, in this context, I would also like to point out, as I to, to, to stress, as I did before, that despite the general trends, what is interesting in this context is that flows to individual countries, for example, Indonesia or Vietnam, have not been reversed uh, post COVID-19. Now, let me come finally to um, the long run picture. So the long run effects and questions. And these are, I think, effects that have that are predominantly due to the global policy response. Um, uh, so, so the general problem is that that we have all redefined our priorities. We have redefined our priorities in research, and policymakers have redefined their priorities in policy, and their long term policy agendas have shifted. And uh, I think perhaps the, the biggest challenge in my mind is not what's what's happening in developing countries but what is not happening uh, there. At the same time, existing promise and trends have been exacerbated. So let me um, uh, highlight some of the issues um, uh, in different areas as I see them. Uh, let's start with human capital, because the effects on COVID-19 on human capital are uh, some of the biggest effects in my mind. Uh, we all know that, that uh, in, their, uh, in the attempt to contain the spread of the virus, almost all countries closed schools, some of them temporarily, some of them on, more, on, more, on a more permanent uh, basis. And we all hope that one day schools will reopen. But the general question is to what extent will this hopefully temporary school uh, uh, closing, so this hopefully uh, transitory shock, to what extent will it have long run persistent effects on human capital? In advanced economies, we are not too worried about that. We are worried about the inequalities that school closings may generate. But I think in developing countries, it's a very different story. So in the area of education, in, in some countries, we have public school closures. For example, in Kenya has canceled the school year for the entire year going forward. Uh, that raises many questions for it, that, that we don't worry about in richer countries. For example, will the kids come back to school afterwards? Uh, what are the effects on girls' education? There is some very interesting work by Oriana Bandiera and, and several co-authors on the effects of the Ebola epidemic in West Africa and Sierra Leone, in particular, where they show that what happened is when they, school, when they closed schools, students dropped out, including girls. When they reopened the schools, the girls didn't come back. And we took special interventions to make them come, come, come back. So um, uh, uh, the question is, to what extent will these school closures that we view as temporary have effects on girls' education and also on other marginalized groups? Um, another question is, many countries in uh, in developing economies, just like in the US or in Europe, have switched to online learning. Um, to what extent can online learning in these countries substitute for, uh, for uh, in-person education? There's actually some interesting work uh, going on there. There, there's some, there were some very useful interventions on uh, Botswana. That I know there's a paper presented um, in, uh, in the conference by Norm Angrist and co-authors. That, that showed that, that some online interventions were actually very successful in alleviating this problem. And so there, is, there are many interesting mechanism design questions there. What kind of interventions can alleviate all these problems that we see as a result of school closures? In the domain of health, there are, there are equally important questions. Uh, there have been many disruptions in routine healthcare, uh, lapses in vaccinations, 
uh, decline in child and maternal care. Again, in advanced economies, we, we, we think of many of these issues as being only temporary. So you didn't get your vaccination this month, maybe you can wait a few months later. I think it's a very different story in developing countries where it took in many, in many cases, it took intense information campaigns to convince people to get vaccinated. And again, the question is just like with school closures, are people who are postponing vaccinations, are they going to eventually get vaccinated? Um, what about nutritional needs? There has been a lot of evidence based on these real-time surveys that in many cases, uh, people express concerns about uh, food security, that, that many were not getting nutritional meals. What are the long-run effects of all these interventions, uh, of all these uh, problems? Um, and again, we have plenty of evidence about short-run effects. We know based on all these real-time surveys, that these effects have been very severe in the short run. Uh, but the interesting question is, are they going to translate to long run effects? And, and this is, I think this, this should be an important research agenda for developing countries going forward. More generally, you can generalize all these questions to the more general question of how poverty and inequality will be affected. And I already mentioned the effects that, that uh, can happen through human capital. There are additional effects that come through employment. So we know from the financial crisis in the US that, that the financial crisis had also long run effects through job loss and through the loss of income. At a minimum, you may lose skills, you may lose connections, you may lose the potential to make good matches during that time. Now, what makes developing countries different is that they have a very large informal sector. And in this particular setting, it's not clear whether this is an advantage or a disadvantage. In the short run, for the purpose of social protection, the informal sector was a big challenge because it made it much harder for policymakers to reach those in need. But on the other hand, one could make the argument that as the as economies start recovering, having a sector that's very flexible may prove an advantage and it may become much easier for people to reconnect to jobs. We don't know if this is true. Again, I think this is a very interesting research question going forward. There are many questions regarding differential sector exposure, just as in the US and in the advanced economies, services and tourism have been very severely affected. Commodity markets, again, commodities have been affected in developing countries. This is likely to affect different developing countries differently. And finally, I will mention gender. Uh, the effects on gender are going to also be very important in my view for, for various reasons. I already mentioned the effects to human capital and the potential effects that school closures may have on long-term education for girls. There is the sector, the sectoral exposure. Women are predominantly employed in the service sector, and the service sector has been hit particularly hard in this uh, crisis. There is the fact that um, in developing countries we have a lot of work from home and informality, and again, women are overrepresented in these sectors. How? What are the implications uh, for women? through this channel. And finally, I think this is important. Uh, there's also the fact that, that the current pandemic has led to um, a halt of reforms. Um, uh, Nina mentioned at the beginning that I have also been working, I started this work while I, while I was at the World Bank on legal discrimination against women. And in, in some work we, we've done, we've shown that in many developing countries, legal barriers are still uh, very important, legal barriers to full uh, labor force uh, participation. So um, the, the, the positive development of the last uh, decade, of the last two decades, was that many developing countries were conducting reforms to better the position of women. And of course, these were reforms in the books, it doesn't. It didn't necessarily mean that they were be the, 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 that they were going to be implemented. But nevertheless, they were an important step towards gender equality. Uh, there is a the concern that, as a result of of uh, the pandemic, this agenda is on the back burner right now, and that may lead to a long run uh, uh, reversal of uh, of uh, progress that, that was made in the past. Um, and a, a third area that is very likely to be affected is globalization. And again, I've talked in different uh, forms about this. Um, there are 
COVID-19 has affected um, globalization or the trend towards deglobalization in many different channels. So first, let me say that uh, no matter what you think about globalization, I think it has been important for poverty reduction in many developing countries, so especially in Asia, especially in East Asia. So um, globalization is an important issue when it comes to developing countries. And to the extent that there has been a trend towards D or slow globalization, if you want, the big losers, if this continues, are not going to be the advanced countries. Um, as, as many have pointed out, the marginal gains from additional globalization in, develop, in, in advanced economies are relatively small. It's going to be the developing countries, it's going to be the poor countries that are going to be affected the most. So how will COVID-19 affect, uh, affect this trend? Uh, what we saw happening with uh, COVID-19 is that global supply chains were blamed for shortages of uh, personal protective equipment and also for uh, food shortages. Uh, there is a question out there, is this true or is it fiction? It would be important to get the facts straight. To make clear where I stand on this, I, I truly think this was pure fiction. It was a red herring and uh, it was not supported by the evidence. It was a narrative that, that was very convenient to the current administration. And then, however, many reasonable people jumped on board and then it became yet another reason to... Um, turn against globalization. Um, so, so independent of this question, I think there is a more general question, which is whether global supply chains amplify or diversify risk. And I think this is an interesting question. This is not a question we asked before COVID-19, but again, this is a question that we should be pursuing. Um, uh, independent of what answer you, you, you give to this question, I believe that one thing that the pandemic has done is it, it made it more likely that this trend towards D or slow globalization that we had witnessed even before the pandemic is going to be accelerated. And that, that again is going to lead to many very specific questions. So let me mention some of them. There is, I won't rule out a new wave of protectionism. Um, we'll see what happens with the US elections, but I think, I think it's fair to say that there has been bipartisan support uh, in, in the last year in the US for the US turning inward of, of putting its own citizens first. Um, and uh, as I mentioned earlier, these, these, uh, these, uh, these arguments against global supply chains, they were not voiced just by one party. Again, there was bipartisan support for, uh, for, um, for reshoring activities. Um, we also see a different type of protectionism emerging in Europe. Uh, and I would link that to, to the crisis, to the pandemic for the following reason. When, when Europe, when the European Union passed this very aggressive and, and very well needed stimulus package, the, the question came up, how are we going to finance this? And one, two of the ways that Europe suggested were digital taxes, and carbon border taxes. So carbon border taxes are a form of protection, no matter what you think about climate change. And it's a form of protection that is going to have particularly severe implications for developing countries. Immigration restrictions are likely to stay in place or, or you know, to continue. So these are all policies that may be implemented going forward, and they will raise many very specific questions about what the effects are on developing countries. There are, more, there, there, there are more general policy design questions. For example, the role of the World Trade Organization. The, more generally, the, the role of multilateral institutions in managing global crises. Uh, there is the question of what's the best way to achieve global consensus on important issues. Should we be pushing more for regional agreements versus plurilateral versus multilateral agreements? So these are concrete policy questions that um, that have come up before, but I think they're becoming even more important in the aftermath of the crisis. And as a result, I see the field of international trade as becoming much more policy oriented and policy driven. Uh, this is actually a point that I have made before that perhaps international trade was not enough uh, uh, policy focused as other fields. 
I think what has happened in the last year is likely to, to uh, push the field in a much more policy relevant direction. And the more general question, I think that that applies not just to trade economies, but to development economies in general, is what is going to be the vision for development in a more closed world. So if we think that as a result of the pandemic, this trend towards DOS low globalization is going to be intensified. So if we have more closed economies, if openness is no longer the engine of growth, what is the vision? What is, what is the model of development that uh, we should be thinking of? So this is more of a, of a macro, if you want, or a, macro, a macro type question, but nevertheless, I think it's quite important. Technology and automation. I think this is a first order uh, uh, area. Uh, as with the globalization or slow globalization, if you want to call it this way, there was a strong pre-existing trend towards automation. And many people, not just in advanced countries, but also in developing countries, were worried that machines were going to replace people. And in the process, they were going to render the traditional comparative advantage of developing countries in low-skilled labor, they were going to render this advantage irrelevant. Uh, when it comes to COVID-19, uh, I think it's fair to say that technology was the savior in high-income countries. It allowed many of us to work from home. It, it allowed us to have this conference online. Um, it allowed to a certain extent for online teaching. Uh, without online teaching, <laughs> schools would have been completely closed. However, it also generated very strong inequality effects. Uh, the big tech, uh, those of us who can work remotely are potentially better off, and those who cannot uh, are, uh, are the big losers. We've thought a lot about these issues in the context of the US and in the context of advanced countries. I think the effects in developing countries could potentially uh, be even more, uh, uh, even larger. And uh, they may differ drastically across countries, depending on the structure of the economy. There, you know, the difference between an upper middle income country and the low income agricultural economy is important. You would also expect to see big, skill, big differences across skills, occupations, generations, gender. But I think this is an agenda that's incredibly important. And again, what the COVID-19 shock does is it gives us a shock that a plausibly, a plausibly exogenous shock to try to investigate how these trends have been uh, affected. Uh, and uh, finally, there are also the macro effects to consider. So if you have automation and deglobalization, does this imply, as I said, the end of the export-led uh, 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 growth model of development? Does, does it imply that advanced countries will be reshoring activities more and more? And if so, what is the implication for developing countries? Climate change. Climate change, again, many interesting questions. So in the short term, the environment was considered to be the big winner. The pollution declined. I would say that in the long run, the effects are potentially detrimental. And let me briefly explain why. As with a gender, as with gender, the climate change agenda is on the back burner. Very few think seriously about climate change right now. Uh, once again, many countries uh, are prioritizing growth that's what's in, in policy makers' minds. This is the big priority right now. While, as I pointed out earlier, at the same time, what we've done by shutting down the economy shows that in many countries, even in low-income in countries, people are concerned about more than growth. So, so I view that as a, uh, to a certain extent as, 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 um, as a, an inconsistent, inconsistency uh, here. Um, more specifically, uh, it may lead to the demise of public transportation. Uh, in the United States, car sales are up. I don't know what the picture is in developing countries, but while pub investments in public transportation were considered to be a big priority prior to COVID-19, now such investments may be considered less desirable. So we may start building bridges in instead of uh, railroad trucks. And finally, if you want to be a true pessimist, it may lead to the demise of cities, uh, both because people prefer to live in big suburban homes and also because many cities um, are facing bankruptcy. Um, again, I'm not sure to what extent these concerns may apply to developing countries, 
but there are issues that um, are important. Uh, the more general questions that regard climate change uh, are, and I mentioned those earlier, are what, is, what does our behavior reveal about what the value of a statistical life is? I, I, this term is actually a, a loaded term. Um, it, it's not, uh, it, it's a very, in my view, it's a very narrow way to think about human life. But nevertheless, I would make again the point that the fact that we're willing as, as uh, a society that we're willing to shut down the world economy to protect lives contains a lot of information about the trade-offs we're willing to make. They contain a lot of information about the discount rate and also about our attitudes toward tail risks. And these are questions that are very important when we try to figure out what our policy towards climate change is. And finally, let me finish very briefly with institutions. Uh, one question here is which institutions are associated with better outcomes? It has been hypothesized that autocracies in this context did better than democracies because you need a strong leader to take action. It's been hypothesized that societies in which there was trust did better. Uh, what's the role of welfare state? And finally, uh, there is the question of going forward, how will COVID-19 affect demand for more state control. So will we see citizens willing to take more uh, authoritarian uh, uh, actions in return for more safety? Uh, how will citizens be willing to trade off privacy versus effective track and tracing? And finally, how are we going to think about human rights, human rights protection versus social good? Uh, these are all questions that have come up in the context of institutions. And I don't think these are questions just for economists. I think these are questions for social scientists in general. So I realized that this uh, talk became very long. So let me just conclude by reiterating the fact that, that this is the biggest shock, if not the biggest, this is the biggest shock after World War II. Uh, at the same time, I think it represents a momentous uh, event for social sciences. Uh, it, it's, it's going to redefine research agendas in the future. And in the process of the talk, I, I mentioned several very concrete questions raising, uh, ranging from measurement, how do we measure deaths, to concrete policy or mechanism design questions, how do we design interventions that are going to minimize, minimize the impact of COVID-19, uh, uh, research questions on the long run effects, what are the long run effects on human capital and so on. But I think this uh, pandemic also raises more general philosophical questions, if you want, about the value of life, our priorities, the role of state institutions, and, and among other things, uh, the role of science and scientists. And again, it would be very constructive in my view to try to answer these questions in a structured framework as economists like to, to employ. Uh, not only because they're intellectually interesting, but because the answers to these questions may inform other important agendas. They may inform the question of how do we deal with tail risks going forward, but they may, may also inform our response to climate change, which is another big priority. So I'll stop here and thank you very much for your patience. Penny, thank you very much for uh, this uh, great thought-provoking talk. You, know, you, you highlighted kind of big picture questions that this pandemic raised for um, societies throughout the world, uh, discuss measurement issues, uh, and also kind of what we learned in the short run and what, what is the agenda for policymakers and the researchers over the long run. Because we are running a little bit short of time, I just want to emphasize that I know that some of you will be leaving us to join the NUDC conference. Uh, the way you join that, that you, you basically go on the website and click on uh, Zoom link uh, of each of the uh, sessions. But for those of you who are uh, staying here, uh, we do have a few uh, uh, questions for, uh, for Penny from, from the audience that I, uh, that I have uh, uh, aggregated. So a lot of people, uh, there were many questions during uh, Q&A about uh, importance of measurement, uh, data availability, both in the real time and over the longer run. Uh, uh, to answer a lot of the important questions that you uh, brought up uh, during your talk. 
uh, and, uh, and uh, what people are wondering is based on your experience uh, as the chief economist of the World Bank and as the researcher working on these issues and you know, having colleagues work on these issues, you know, how do you think we can improve real-time data collection during pandemics uh, and in general kind of cooperation between international organizations, uh, individual researchers to make progress both to uh, improve our short-term responses to pandemics as well as study kind of longer term implications of pandemics. Um, thank you, Nina. So, so, so let me say, I, I, I don't have all the answers, but, but I, I can give some thoughts regarding the real-time response. So first, I think, as I said during the talk, the, the real-time response, in my view, was remarkable. It was actually quite good. This doesn't mean that it cannot be improved, but it was much better than in the past. And I would credit technology with that. So because of, the, of, of current technologies, we're able to do things we were not able to do before. We are able to reach people through phones. Uh, as soon, most people, even in developing countries, have access to a smartphone. Um, in some cases, you were able to, to, to contact them uh, through the internet. Um, so, so the response has been better than before. Uh, where do I see the challenges? So number one, I think, and that was mentioned, th there could be better coordination. So I think one challenge uh, in uh, the current pandemic was you were getting information from many different sites, from many different sources. The information that was coming in almost got journalistic character. It was like journalists from all parts of the world uh, reporting what was going on on the ground. And that was very helpful. But in the end, you were not sure what the global picture was, right? And uh, I, I'm not sure this is a negative, like I'm not sure this could be different because we, we're doing things in real time. It, 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 we're collecting information as the pandemic was, was, um, was spreading. So I'm not sure that, that there is another model that we could do research, but, but I think that going forward, it would be important to try to aggregate this information to, to, to see if there were differences across settings, across countries. Uh, which communities did well, which communities did not. Um, and again, that's, that's why I'm suggesting that, that we are, or once we have this pandemic under control, we can move to the next stage, which is the true research stage, where we try to, to, do, to make the best out of this information. Two points I want to make is, number one, I think, yes, this, the short run response is important, but also, you know, many of us are researchers, we're academics, and we should not lose sight of the fact that long-term research is important too, right? We want robust results. Sometimes what you say in the first month may not prove to be robust. It was important to do that in this case, most importantly, because we needed to channel aid to the right uh, sources. And that, that did happen to, to, to a certain extent, but we also need long-term research. So, and, and that was one point of my talk. The second one, you know, to be more specific in my answer to the question was asked, I'm a big believer in technology. So I do think technology can help. Uh, it, it did its job this time and going forward, we can develop technology tools more effectively to, 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 to guide aid. Yeah, thank you. And then uh, let me, uh, the, uh, another question that was asked is uh, the following. Developing countries are poor and have lower government revenues by spending lots during the first wave of pandemic they are less likely to have the resources uh, for the second and third, uh, thir if the second and third wave happens. Uh, you also, you know, tax collection also deteriorates. Uh, you know, what's the best that, uh, you know, that international organizations or communities uh, help uh, uh, for, you know, countries in these situations? should there be a global leader? Yeah, so I think, <clears throat> uh, uh, first of all, we have much more, information now than we had at the beginning of the pandemic. And um, to a certain extent, th 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 there is some good news for developing countries. So I remember back in March, uh, the World Bank was trying to figure out how to mobilize resources so that many developing countries could buy ventilators. By now we know uh, across the world that ventilators are not as helpful as once thought. So uh, there is more information about where the expenditure should go. So perhaps one thing we know, rather than buying ventilators, try to channel the money towards cash transfers to compensate those who, who have lost their income. Uh, so, so we have more information so that, that whatever resources are available can be spent uh, more wisely. 
That said, there is no question that developing countries face enormous challenges precisely because they have fewer resources. And uh, there are big structural issues that cannot be solved now. There is, there is a long-standing issue that the tax revenues are very low. <laughs> and so that there is no fiscal space. And again, that's to a certain extent what defines a developing economy to a certain extent. So this is, this is not the right time to solve this problem. The only way to, to, to survive is through some uh, international support, so through some international aid, and, and the international community uh, should help. I think it's fair to say that the World Bank and, and actually all these international institutions have showed willingness to, 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 to support developing countries. Uh, and, and that's the good news. And I, the last question is going to be a big picture question. Uh, so uh, some people say that uh, you know the current pandemic has shown that the current system is unsustainable and growth is the main problem. And they're wondering, you know, how can you know what have we learned from the pandemic on how countries can grow sustainably? Uh, I'm not sure I would agree that the current pandemic has shown that 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 uh, the current system is unsustainable. I, I don't know what this means. Uh, it's not the first time that we are faced with a pandemic. Uh, I would actually, uh, let me flip it around. We were able to shut down the economy for several months. And this is because we had amassed resources to do so. Uh, in the United States and in Europe, there was a massive uh, relief program, uh, a successful, re successful relief programs that managed to compensate not everyone, but at least a good fraction of the population. The reason we were able to do so is because we had uh, benefited from the growth of the past. So, so I'm not sure that I would write off growth uh, completely. And the fact that developing countries are in such uh, in a worse situation is precisely because they don't have these resources, because they didn't have the growth and, and poverty reduction that advanced economies by definition had in the past. That said, where, where I agree, and that's the point I want, I try to make is that growth is not everything, right? And, and the one thing that this pandemic, our response to the pandemic demonstrated is that we are willing to sacrifice growth to save human lives or you know, to, to make sure that people don't get severely sick. And if we're willing to do something as drastic as shutting down the economy, no one would have thought this possible two years ago, and yet we did it, right? If we can do that, why can't we do something less drastic, which is sacrifice growth, at least in a country like the United States, sacrifice a little bit of growth to make sure that the, the, the air is cleaner, <laughs> the water is cleaner. Right, so, so why are, not, are we not willing to make this trade-off? I also will add that I understand that these trade-offs are triggered in developing countries, but at least in this country, we should be able to, we should be willing to make these trade-offs. Yeah, thank, uh, thank you so much, uh, Penny, for all of your thoughts on these very complicated uh, issues and giving the, uh, uh, the researchers, many and policymakers, many, many ideas uh, on kind of big issues that uh, we need to focus on uh, going forward. So uh, thank you also everybody else for joining us. And I hope that many of you can also join us for the remainder of the NEUDC conference. There are over 200 papers, some of them actually focusing on the pandemic and many other issues. So uh, there's a lot to be uh, learned there. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Nina. Yeah. Bye everyone. Bye.